Chapter 4 Target Sicily The plan of action agreed by Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt when they met in Casablanca in January 1943 was, in some respects, blindingly obvious. After the successful North Africa campaign, the next target would be the island of Sicily. The Nazi war machine was at last beginning to stutter and misfire. The British Eighth Army under Montgomery had vanquished Rommel's invincible Africa Corps at El Alamein. The Allied invasion of Morocco and Tunisia had fatally weakened Germany's grip, and with the liberation of Tunis, the Allies would control the coast of North Africa, its ports and airfields, from Casablanca to Alexandria. The time had come to lay siege to Hitler's fortress. But where? Sicily was the logical place from which to deliver the gut punch into what Churchill famously called the soft underbelly of the Axis. The island at the toe of Italy's boot commanded the channel, linking the two sides of the Mediterranean, just eighty miles from the Tunisian coast. If the combined British and American armies were to free Europe, prize Italy out of the fascist embrace, and roll back the Nazi behemoth, they would first have to take Sicily. The British in Malta and Allied convoys had been pummeled by Luftwaffe bombers taking off from the island, and, as Montague remarked, no major operation could be launched, maintained, or supplied until the enemy airfields and other bases in Sicily had been obliterated so as to allow free passage through the Mediterranean. An invasion of Sicily would open the road to Rome, draw German troops from the Eastern Front to relieve the Red Army, allow for preparations to invade France, and perhaps knock a tottering Italy out of the war. Breaking up the Pact of Steel forged in 1939 by Hitler and Mussolini would shatter German morale, Churchill predicted, and might be the beginning of their doom. The Americans were initially dubious, wondering if Britain harboured imperial ambitions in the Mediterranean, but eventually they compromised. Sicily would be the target, the precursor to the invasion of mainland Europe. If the strategic importance of Sicily was clear to the Allies, it was surely equally obvious to Italy and Germany. Churchill was blunt about the choice of target. Everyone but a bloody fool would know it was Sicily. And if the enemy was foolish enough not to see what was coming, he would surely cotton on when 160,000 British, American and Commonwealth troops and an armada of 3,200 ships began assembling for the invasion. Sicily's 500-mile coastline was already defended by seven or eight enemy divisions. If Hitler correctly anticipated the Allies' next move, then the island would be reinforced by thousands of German troops held in reserve in France. The soft underbelly would become a wall of muscle. The invasion could turn into a bloodbath. But the logic of Sicily was immutable. On January 22nd, Churchill and Roosevelt gave their joint blessing to Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily the next great set-piece offensive of the war. General Eisenhower was summoned to Casablanca and given his orders, all of which presented Allied intelligence chiefs with a fiendish conundrum. How to convince the enemy that the Allies were not going to do what anyone with an atlas could see they ought to do? The previous June, Churchill had established the London Controlling Section, a deliberately vague title, under a controller of deception, Lieutenant Colonel John H. Bevan, to prepare deception plans on a worldwide basis with the object of causing the enemy to waste his military resources. Bevan was responsible for the overall planning, supervision and coordination of strategic deception, and immediately after the Casablanca conference, he was instructed to draw up a new deception policy to disguise the impending invasion of Sicily. The result was Operation Barclay, a complex, many-layered plan that would try to convince the Germans that black was white or, at the very least, grey. Johnny Bevan was an old Etonian and a stockbroker, an upright pillar of the establishment whose convivial and modest temperament belied an exceedingly sharp mind. He had that rare English ability to achieve impressive feats with a permanent air of embarrassment, and he tackled the monumental task of wartime deception in the same way that he played cricket— when things were looking pretty bad for his side at cricket, he would shuffle in, about sixth wicket down, knock up one hundred, and shuffle out again, looking rather ashamed of himself. Bevan played with the straightest of straight bats, as honest and upright a team player as one could imagine, which was probably what made him such a superb deceiver. While Bevan controlled the business of deception from within the cabinet war rooms, the fortified underground bunker beneath Whitehall, 
His counterpart in the Mediterranean was Lieutenant Colonel Dudley Wrangle Clark, the chief of A Force, the deception unit based in Cairo. Clark was another master of strategic deception, but of a very different stamp. Unmarried, nocturnal, and allergic to children, he was possessed of an ingenious imagination and a photographic memory. He also had a flair for the dramatic that invited trouble. For the royal tournament in 1925, he mounted a pageant depicting imperial artillery down the ages, which involved two elephants, 37 guns, and 14 of the biggest Nigerians he could find. He loved uniforms, disguises, and dressing up. Most of one ear was lopped off by a German bullet when he took part in the first commando raid on occupied France, and in 1940 he was summoned to Egypt at the express command of General Sir Archibald Wavell, and ordered to set up a special section of intelligence for deception. Clark and A-Force had spent the last two years baffling and bamboozling the enemy in a variety of complicated and flamboyant ways. Between them, Lieutenant Colonels Bevan and Clark would construct the most elaborate wartime web of deception ever spun. Yet, in its essence, the aim of Operation Barclay was quite simple, to convince the Axis powers that, instead of attacking Sicily in the middle of the Mediterranean, the Allies intended to invade Greece in the east and the island of Sardinia, followed by southern France in the west. The lie went as follows. The British Twelfth Army, which did not exist, would invade the Balkans in the summer of 1943, starting in Crete and the Peloponnese, bringing Turkey into the war against the Axis powers, moving against Bulgaria and Romania, linking up with the Yugoslav resistance, and then finally uniting with the Soviet armies on the Eastern Front. The subsidiary lie was intended to convince the Germans that the British Eighth Army planned to land on France's southern coast and then storm up the Rhone Valley once American troops under General Patton had attacked Corsica and Sardinia. Sicily would be bypassed. If Operation Barclay succeeded, the Germans would reinforce the Balkans, Sardinia and southern France in preparation for invasions that would never materialise, while leaving Sicily only lightly defended. At the very least, enemy troops would be spread over a broad front, and the German defensive shield would be weakened. By the time the real target became obvious, it would be too late to reinforce Sicily. The deception plan played directly on Hitler's fears, for the ultra-intercepts had clearly revealed that the Führer, his staff, and local commanders in Greece all feared that the Balkans represented a vulnerable point on the Nazi southern flank. Even so, shifting German attention away from Sicily would not be easy, for the strategic importance of the island was self-evident. A German intelligence report produced in early February for the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, OKW, was quite explicit and accurate about Allied intentions. The idea of knocking Italy out of the war after the conclusion of the African campaign, by means of air attacks and a landing operation, looms large in Anglo-Saxon deliberations. Sicily offers itself as the first target. The deception operation would need to shift Hitler's mind in two different directions, reducing his fears for Sicily, while stoking his anxiety about Sardinia, Greece and the Balkans. Uncle John Godfrey identified what he called wishfulness and yesmanship as the twin frailties of German intelligence. If the authorities were clamouring for reports on a certain subject... The German secret intelligence service was not above inventing reports based on what they thought probable. The Nazi high command, at the same time, when presented with contradictory intelligence reports, was inclined to believe the one that fits in best with their own previously formed conceptions. If Hitler's paranoid wishfulness and his underlings' craven yesmanship could be exploited, then Operation Barclay might work. The Germans would deceive themselves. The deception swung into action on a range of fronts. Engineers began fabricating a bogus army in the eastern Mediterranean. Double agents started feeding false information to their Abwehr handlers. Plans were drawn up for counterfeit troop movements, fake radio traffic, recruitment of Greek interpreters and officers, and the acquisition of Greek maps and currency to indicate an impending assault on the Peloponnese. While Bevan and Clark began weaving together the strands of Operation Barclay, Montague and Chumley went hunting for a dead body. In his initial plan, Chumley had assumed one could simply pop into a military hospital and pick a bargain cadaver off the shelf for ten pounds. The reality was rather different. 
The Second World War may have been responsible for the deaths of more people than any conflict in history, yet dead bodies of the right sort were surprisingly hard to find. People tended to be killed, or to kill themselves, in all the wrong ways. A bombing victim would never do. Suicides were more common than in peacetime, but these were usually by rope, gas, or chemical means that could easily be detected in a post-mortem examination. Moreover, the requirements were specific. The plan called for a fresh male body of military age, with no obvious injuries or infirmities, and cooperative next of kin who would not object when the corpse of their loved one was whisked away for unspecified purposes, in an unstipulated place, by complete strangers. For advice, Montague turned to someone who knew more about death than any man living. Sir Bernard Spilsbury was the senior pathologist of the Home Office, an expert witness in many of the most famous trials of the age, and the pioneer of the modern science of forensics. Sir Bernard collected deaths as other people collect stamps or books. For half a century, until his own mysterious demise in 1949, Spilsbury accumulated ordinary deaths and extraordinary deaths, carrying out some 25,000 autopsies. He studied death by asphyxiation, poisoning, accident, and murder, and he jotted down the particulars of each case in his spidery handwriting on thousands of index cards, laying the foundations for modern crime scene investigation, CSI. Spilsbury had come to public attention with the infamous Dr. Crippen case of 1910. When Michigan-born Dr. Hawley Harvey Crippen was captured attempting to flee to North America with his mistress, it was Spilsbury who identified the remains buried in his cellar in London as those of his missing wife, Cora, through distinctive scar tissue on a fragment of skin. Crippen was hanged in 1910. Over the next thirty years, Spilsbury would testify in courtrooms across the land, laying out the Crown's case in clear, precise, inarguable tones of moral rectitude. The newspapers adored this erect, handsome figure in the witness box, combining scientific certainty with Edwardian moral character. As one contemporary observed, Spilsbury was a one-man instrument of retribution. He could achieve single-handed all the legal consequences of homicide, arrest, prosecution, conviction, and final post-mortem, requiring only the brief assistance of the hangman. His courtroom manner was famously oracular and clipped, never using three words where one would suffice. He formed his opinion, expressed it in the clearest, most succinct manner possible, then stuck to it, come hell or high water. Before Spilsbury, forensic pathology was widely discredited, regarded as scientifically and medically dubious. However, by 1943, he had helped to transform the study of dead bodies, the beastly science, as it was known, into a branch of science both ghoulish and glamorous. Simultaneously, he acquired a reputation for experimenting on himself. Spilsbury inhaled carbon monoxide to test its effect on the body, and made notes on his sensations, which were unpleasant. He climbed down a manhole in Red Cross Street to check on gas that had killed a workman. When he accidentally swallowed meningitis germs in a hospital laboratory, he just carried on. It was rumoured that Sir Bernard could identify the cause of death simply by smelling a corpse. In 1938, the Washington Post hailed him as England's modern Sherlock Holmes. But a lifetime of inhaling death, peering into cadavers, and familiarity with the darkest sides of human nature had affected the great scientist. Media attention had gone to his head. Sir Bernard was aloof, arrogant, and utterly convinced of his own infallibility. He saw the world bleakly, through a veil of cynicism and self-satisfaction, and seldom evinced a shred of sympathy for anyone, living or dead. With heavy-lidded eyes and a haughty, aristocratic bearing, he looked like a lizard in a lab coat, and smelled permanently of formaldehyde. Ewan Montague arranged to meet the famous pathologist over a glass of lukewarm sherry at Spilsbury's club the junior Carlton, in Pall Mall. Spilsbury had already done macabre service for British intelligence. Captured enemy spies were offered a stark choice, either work as double agents or face execution. Most agreed to cooperate, but a few resisted or were deemed unusable. These, the unlucky sixteen as they became known, were tried and executed. Spilsbury was brought in to carry out autopsies on these executed spies, including Josef Jacobs, shot by firing squad in the summer of 1941. 
the last person to be executed in the Tower of London. Sir Bernard was sixty-six, but looked far older. Montague was not in the habit of subservience, but he had seen Spilsbury perform in court, and was deeply in awe of that extraordinary man. Conscious of how odd the word sounded, the younger man explained that the Navy wanted the Germans and Spaniards to accept a floating body as that of a victim of an aircraft disaster. What manner of death would fit in with the impression the government wished to give? Spilsbury's heavy lids did not even blink at the question. Indeed, as Montague later recorded, never once did he ask why I wanted to know or what I was proposing to do. There was a long pause while the forensic scientist considered the question and sipped his sherry. Finally, in his courtroom voice, clear, resonant, without any trace of uncertainty, he presented his verdict. The easiest way, of course, would be to find a drowned man and float him ashore in a life jacket. But failing that, any number of other causes of death would do. For the victims of air accidents at sea, Spilsbury explained, do not necessarily die from traumatic injury or drowning. Many die from exposure or even from shock. Spilsbury returned to his laboratory at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, and Montague reported back to Chumley that the hunt for a suitable corpse might be easier than they had anticipated. Even so, it was hardly possible to ask around for a dead body, as gossip would undoubtedly spread and embarrassing questions would ensue. Briefly they considered whether grave robbery might be the answer, doing a burke and hare, but that idea was swiftly scotched. In 1827, William Burke and William Hare stole the body of an army pensioner from its coffin, and sold it to the Edinburgh Medical College for seven pounds. They went on to murder sixteen people, selling their bodies for medical dissection. Hare testified against Burke, who was hanged and publicly dissected. This was not a happy comparison. Stealing corpses was unpleasant, immoral, and illegal, and even if they were successful, a body that had lain in earth for only a few days would be too decomposed for use. What was needed was a discreet and helpful individual with legal access to plenty of fresh corpses. Montague knew just such a man, the coroner of St. Pancras in northwest London, who went by the delightfully Dickensian name of Bentley Purchase. Under English law, the coroner, a post dating back to the 11th century, is the government official responsible for investigating deaths, particularly those that occur under unusual circumstances and determining their causes. When a death is unexpected, violent, or unnatural, the coroner is responsible for deciding whether to hold a post-mortem and, if necessary, an inquest. Bentley Purchase was a friend and colleague of Spilsbury in the death business, but Purchase was as cheery as Sir Bernard was grim. Indeed, for a man who spent his life with the dead, the coroner was the life and soul of every occasion. He found death not only fascinating but extremely funny, which, of course, it is. No form of violent or mysterious mortality surprised or upset him. A depressing job, he once said. Far from it. I can't imagine it getting me down. He would offer slightly damp chocolates to guests in his private chambers, and joke, they were found in Auntie's bag when she was fished out of the round pond at Hampstead last night. A farmer by birth, Purchase was rugged in appearance and character, with an impish sense of humour and a finely calibrated sense of the ridiculous. He loved Gilbert and Sullivan operas, toy trains, boiled eggs, and his model Piggery in Ipswich. He never wore a hat, and laughed loudly and often. Montague knew Purchase as an old friend from my barrister days, and dropped him a note, asking if they might meet to discuss a confidential matter. Purchase replied with directions to the St. Pancras Coroner's Court, and a typically jovial postscript, an alternative means of getting here is, of course, to get run over. Purchase had fought in the First World War as a doctor attached to the field artillery, winning the military cross for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, and fighting on until 1918, when a shell splinter removed most of his left hand. By the time war broke out again, he was nearly fifty, too old to wear a uniform, but aching to get into the war. Indeed, he had already demonstrated a willingness to help the intelligence services and, if necessary, distort the truth in the service of security. When an Abwehr spy named William Rolfe killed himself by putting his head in a gas oven in 1940, 
purchase obliged with a verdict of heart attack. In the same month that he received Montague's note, Purchase had been called in to deliberate on the case of Paul Manuel, an agent of the Free French Intelligence Service, who had been found hanging in a London basement following interrogation as a suspected enemy agent. Purchase's inquest was cursory in the extreme. The coroner was initially dubious when Montague explained that he needed to find a male corpse for a warlike operation, but did not wish to disclose why a body was needed. "'You can't get bodies just for the asking, you know,' Purchase told him, grinning. "'I should think bodies are the only commodities not in short supply at the moment. "'But even with bodies all over the place, each one has to be accounted for.' "'Montague would say only that the scheme required a fresh cadaver "'that might appear to have drowned or died in an air accident. "'The matter, he added gravely, was of national importance. "'Still, Purchase hesitated.' pointing out that if word got out that the legal system for disposing of the dead was being circumvented, public confidence in coroners of the country would be shaken. At what level has this scheme been given approval? the coroner asked. Montague paused before replying, not entirely truthfully, the Prime Minister's. That was enough for Bentley Purchase, whose well-developed sense of comedy was now thoroughly aroused. Chortling, he explained that, as a coroner, he had absolute discretion over the paperwork, and that, in certain circumstances, a death could be concealed, and a body obtained, without getting official permission from anyone. A coroner, he explained, could, in fact, always get rid of a corpse by a certificate that it was going to be buried outside the country. It would then be assumed that a relative was taking it home, e.g. to Ireland, for burial, and the coroner could then do what he liked with it, without let, hindrance, or trace. Bodies were pouring into London morgues at an unprecedented rate. In the previous year, Purchase had dealt with 1,855 cases, and held inquests into 726 sudden deaths. Many of the bodies remained unidentified, and were in the end buried as unknowns. One of these would surely fit the bill. The St. Pancras mortuary was attached to the coroner's court, so Purchase offered to give Montague a tour of the bodies currently in cold storage. After one or two possible corpses had been inspected and for various reasons rejected, the two men shook hands and parted, with Purchase promising to keep a lookout for a suitable candidate. The St. Pancras mortuary was without doubt the most unpleasant place Montague had ever been, but then his had been a life almost entirely free of unpleasant places and upsetting sights. Ewan bemoaned the inevitable misery of separation from his family. His letters to Iris are filled with longing and loneliness. I miss you most frightfully, one letter reads, and life has just seemed one long grey monotone since we have been separated. But he had grown to enjoy his existence as a bachelor spy. The interest and pressure of my work managed to keep my morale up, he wrote. In a way it was like a mixture of constructing a crossword puzzle and sawing a jigsaw puzzle, and then waiting to see whether the recipient could and would solve the clues and place the bits together successfully. The only drawback to living at Kensington Court was the presence of Lady Swathling, with whom he argued constantly. He found time to get away for fishing trips to Exmoor. It was lovely to be far from the noise and the worry and just listening to the noise of the stream, he told Iris. I haven't enjoyed anything as much since you left. He relished the fishing most when it was hardest. The greatest fun is the very delicate casting into awkward places. Lord Swathling had taken the Rolls-Royce with him to Townhill, so Montague borrowed a bicycle to commute to work. In order to transport super-secret papers, he bolted a large pannier on the front, to which he chained his briefcase. The head of security at the Naval Intelligence Department questioned whether it was safe to cycle around with a briefcase full of secrets. What if the case was stolen? But after some argument, Montague was given formal permission to continue with this unorthodox arrangement for transporting documents, as long as I always wore a shoulder holster and an automatic pistol. On January 24th, 1943, Montague cycled back, as usual, to Kensington Court, where the massive front door was opened by Ward the butler. Nancy, one of the best cooks in London, had rustled up a fine dinner in spite of rationing, although the dowager Lady Swadling insisted that standards had slipped. Mother is too awful for words. 
Ewan wrote to Iris. She complains that she can't get her nice chocolates of decent quality, whereas everyone else is overjoyed at getting any at all. Ewan ate alone in the dining room, panelled in oak from the Place Vendôme, beneath the glowering portraits of his ancestors. There was always plenty of cheese. He then spent an hour in the great library, working on the crossword puzzles in his briefcase. The Casablanca conference had ended with the decision to invade Sicily. Chumley's plan to foist a dead body on the Germans with false documents was still only on the drawing board, but the decision at Casablanca had sharply accelerated the timetable. Unless Montague found a suitable body, and fast, Trojan Horse would be, in a manner of speaking, dead in the water. Finally, Montague turned in, returned the papers to his briefcase, locked it, and headed to the basement bedroom, where he now slept because of air raids. Mabel the maid, who had been in the family for more than thirty-five years, had turned down the crisp cotton sheets on the bed. That same evening, in a grimy, disused warehouse on the other side of London, a young Welshman swallowed a large dose of rat poison, ending a life that could not have been more different in every conceivable way from that of the Honourable Ewan Montague. Chapter 5 The Man Who Was Ababagoid was a grim place a century ago, a brooding village of coal-dusted sadness. The colliery opened in 1903. Before the coal was found, there was nothing at Ababargoid, save the green valleys. With the coal came rows of pinched terraced streets, housing hundreds of miners and their families. Without coal, the town was nothing, and when the coal ran out, as it eventually did, there was nothing much left. Even before the First World War, Ababargoid was suffering and struggling. Into this bleak world, Glindower Michael was born, January 4th, 1909, at 136 Commercial Street. His mother was Sarah Ann Chadwick, his father a colliery hauler named Thomas Michael. What few records have survived of this family give a flavour of their hard, gritty lives. At the age of twenty, in 1888, Sarah had married another coal miner, George Cottrell. She signed their marriage certificate with a cross. Sarah never learned to read or write, or had any use for either skill. Although two daughters resulted from her marriage to Cottrell, the relationship did not last, and by 1904 she was living with Thomas Michael in a cramped house beside the railway line at Dinas. They never married. Like his father, who died of tuberculosis when Thomas was a child, Thomas Michael had been a coal miner all his life. A Welsh Baptist, born in Dinas, he worked deep in the pits, hauling coal trucks by hand through the dark and wretched bowels of the earth. At some point before meeting Sarah, Thomas Michael contracted syphilis, which he passed on to her, and which apparently went untreated. It is possible that when Glendower Michael was born, his parents bequeathed him congenital syphilis, which can cause damage to the bones, eyes, and brain. When Glyn was an infant, the family moved twelve miles from Ababagoid to Taft's Well, next to Rockwood Pit, where another child, Doris, was born two years later. Unable to pay the rent, the Michaels moved from one dingy house to another, each more decrepit than the last, first to 7 Garth Street, and then, a few years later, to 28 Cornwall Road, Williamstown, Penny Greig, in the Rhonda Valley, where Sarah gave birth to yet another child, her fifth. There was little food. The children wore shoes once a week to church. Thomas Michael drank. Around 1919, when Glynn was nine or ten years old, his father's health began to decline, probably due to the delayed effects of syphilis, combined with the lung-rotting damage caused by working underground for over three decades. Soon after this, his grandmother died of senile decay. Mental frailty would be a recurrent feature of the family's medical history. Thomas Michael began to cough horribly and sweat at odd times of day. The right side of his chest began to sink inward. By 1924, Michael was no longer able to work, and the family was forced to live on charity from the Pontypridd Union, the second largest poor law authority in Britain. For a time they became homeless and moved into a single room at Llowena Pyre Homes, a charity hostel. The Pontypridd Union paid twenty-three shillings for a man and wife, and two shillings for each child. A family of five was now surviving, barely, on one pound and nine shillings a week. Thomas Michael became melancholic, according to a medical report, 
which described him as confused and very depressed, rapidly losing weight with a racking, rattling cough. Just before Christmas in 1924, Thomas Michael stabbed himself in the throat with a carving knife. He was rushed to Angleton Mental Hospital in Bridge End, where the wound was cleaned and stitched up. Thomas Michael was a mental and physical wreck, coughing blood and in deep mental depression. He was fifty-one years old but looked eighty. Percy Hawkins, the mental hospital nurse, described him. Hair is grey and thin, pupils are somewhat irregular, they react to light and converge, tongue has a dry white fur, teeth very deficient and carious. He is thin and poorly nourished, patient coughs and spits a good deal and sweats heavily at night. Both lungs were riddled with disease. At first, Thomas seems to be recovering. He began to speak quite rationally and to notice his surroundings, but on March 13, 1925, he caught influenza, which developed into bronchial pneumonia with a hectic temperature, copious and foul-smelling expectoration, very weak and depressed. He stopped eating. On March 31st, Thomas Michael died. Glyn Michael, now sixteen years old, had witnessed his father turn from a vigorous coal miner into a diseased husk. He had seen him stab himself, and then watched him fall apart in a lunatic asylum. Glynn had been born poor. Now he was a pauper. He may already have been suffering from mental illness. When Thomas Michael was buried in a common grave in the Trelaw Cemetery, Reverend Overton presiding, Glynn Michael signed the burial register in a blotted uncertain hand, without using capital letters. The widowed Sarah moved, with her three young children, into a minuscule flat in the back streets of Trelaw, now dependent entirely on arms for survival. The Pontypridd Union, however, was going bust, so great was the demand for charity in the struggling South Wales coal fields. A year after Thomas Michael's death, Health Minister Neville Chamberlain told Parliament that the Pontypridd Union had run up an overdraft of £210,000, and further money would be advanced only on condition that the scale of relief was reduced. As the Depression struck, the economic situation in South Wales turned from bad to catastrophic. Glynn found part-time employment as a gardener and labourer, but work was hard to come by. At the outbreak of war in 1939, Sarah and Glyn Michael were still living at 135 Trelaw Road. His two half-sisters and his sister Doris had each married coal miners and now had families of their own. His younger brother had left home. Glyndower was not considered eligible for military service, which suggests that he was unfit either physically or, more probably, mentally. On January 15, 1940, Glynn's mother died in her bed of a heart attack and aortic aneurysm. She was 66. Sarah had been his only emotional support. On January 16, Glyndower Michael witnessed his mother's death certificate, buried her alongside Thomas Michael in the Trelaw Cemetery, and disappeared. A country at war had little attention to spare for a man who was homeless, destitute, and most likely mentally ill. Bentley Purchase often wondered why people came to the capital to die. More than a quarter of all the cases he examined were suicides, but many of these were not Londoners. What impulse, he mused, led men and women to London to end their lives? Was it because the dead from the provinces hoped that in the vastness of the capital one more tragedy would pass unnoticed? Or did they wish to spare relatives and friends the distress that would arise inevitably if they ended their lives on their own doorsteps? Purchase was puzzled in a detached and scientific way. It still surprised him how many people seemed to be utterly friendless and unwanted when they arrived in his mortuary. It is not clear how or when Glyndower Michael got to London. In the winter of 1942, he was staying in a common lodging house in West London, although he also appears to have been sleeping in vacant or abandoned buildings and undergoing some sort of treatment at a lunatic asylum. He was clean-shaven, which suggests he owned a razor, and was living somewhere where he could use it. On January 26, 1943, Michael was found in an abandoned warehouse near King's Cross and taken to St Pancras Hospital, suffering from acute chemical poisoning. As Sir Bernard Spilsbury's case notes attest, suicides in wartime Britain found an extraordinary variety of ways to poison themselves, with lysol disinfectant, camphor, opium, carbolic, hydrochloric acid, alcohol, chloroform, and coal gas. 
Michael ingested rat poison, probably Battle's vermin killer, a paste laced with highly toxic white phosphorus. It was assumed that Michael had killed himself intentionally. His father had attempted suicide, and self-destruction tragically runs in families. But it is also possible that the poisoning was accidental. Rat poison was usually spread on stale bread and other scraps. The phosphorus made it glow in the dark, so the rodents would be attracted by both the light and the smell. It is entirely possible that Michael ate rotting leftover food laced with poison because he was hungry. Phosphorus poisoning is a horrific way to die, as acid in the digestive system reacts with the phosphide to generate the toxic gas phosphine. The pathology follows three distinct phases. Often within minutes, the victim suffers nausea and vomiting, as the phosphorus affects the gastric tract, followed by delirium, cramps, restlessness, convulsions, extreme thirst, and two particularly horrible symptoms peculiar to phosphorus poisoning, smoking stool and garlic breath. The second phase, some twenty-four hours after the initial poisoning, is one of relative calm, when the symptoms appear to subside. In the third phase, the victim suffers a breakdown of the central nervous system, jaundice, coma, kidney, heart and liver failure, and finally death. It took poor Glendower Michael more than two days to die, but he appears to have been sufficiently lucid in the second phase to tell the nurses at St Pancras who he was and what he had eaten. He was pronounced dead on January 28, 1943. At the age of 34, Glendower Michael had simply slipped through the cracks of a wartime society with other concerns. A single man, illegitimate and probably illiterate, without money, friends or family, he had died unloved and unlamented, but not unnoticed. As soon as the body of Glendower Michael reached St Pancras Morgue, Bentley Purchase informed Ewan Montague that a candidate for the project had arrived in his jurisdiction and would be kept in suitable cold storage until we were ready for it. Purchase carried out a swift inquest with a foregone conclusion. In a suspected poisoning, the coroner would normally have held an autopsy. But none was ordered in this case for obvious reasons. Purchase listed Michael as lunatic, which suggests that he had been certified insane and was undergoing treatment. The death certificate, based on the coroner's inquest, describes him as labourer, no fixed abode, and gives the cause of death as phosphorus poisoning, took rat poison, bid kill himself while of unsound mind. Purchase informed the registrar that the body was being removed out of England for burial. In private, the coroner gave Montague a more detailed account. The dead man, he explained, had taken a minimal dose of rat poison. This dose was not sufficient to kill him outright, and its only effect was to impair the functioning of the liver that he died a little time afterwards. The human body normally contains traces of phosphorus, the coroner explained, and phosphorus is not one of the poisons readily traceable after long periods, such as arsenic, which invades the roots of the hair, etc., or strychnine. The rat poison would leave few clues to the cause of death, except possibly faint traces of chemical action in the liver. Determining how the man had died after immersion in water would require a highly skilled medico-criminal chemist, who would have to weigh all the chemical compositions of every organ before he could come to any conclusion. Purchase liked to gamble, and he was willing to bet heavily against anyone being able to determine the cause of death with sufficient certainty to deny the presumption that the man had been drowned or killed by shock through an aeroplane crash and then been immersed in water. For a second, even weightier opinion, Montague turned once more to Sir Bernard Spilsbury, the world's foremost medico-criminal chemist. They met again at the Junior Carlton Club. Sir Bernard's verdict was as dry as his sherry. You have nothing to fear from a Spanish post-mortem, to detect that this young man had not died after an aircraft had been lost at sea would need a pathologist of my experience, and there aren't any in Spain. Spilsbury's answer was typical of the man, typically self-assured, typically laconic, but also, and this was increasingly true of Sir Bernard's lofty pronouncements, typically open to question. For Sir Bernard Spilsbury was not the forensic oracle he had once been. Far from infallible, he had started to make some terrible mistakes. Today, even his evidence in the Crippen case is open to doubt. Utterly convinced of his own rectitude and adamant in his prejudices, 
Spilsbury helped to send 110 men to the gallows. Some, in hindsight, were plainly innocent. His theories and opinions increasingly took precedence over the facts, most notably in the case of Norman Thorne, sentenced to death for killing his girlfriend. The woman had almost certainly committed suicide, and the evidence was at best contradictory. But Spilsbury's testimony was unwavering. Despite a rising tide of protest at the way one man's expertise was sending a possibly innocent man to the gallows, I am a martyr to Spilsburyism, said Thorne, shortly before his execution. By the 1940s, Spilsbury's reputation was fading, his marriage collapsing, and his mind starting to fail. His fabled sense of smell had deserted him. He was overworked, and in 1940 he suffered a small stroke. The death of a son in the Blitz affected him deeply. His answers to Montague's questions bore all the hallmarks of the last days of Sir Bernard Spilsbury, emphatic but questionable, and potentially extremely dangerous. Identifying whether an individual has drowned or died by some other means is one of the oldest and most difficult medical dilemmas. In the 13th century, a book by Chinese physicians entitled The Washing Away of Wrongs addressed the thorny issue of suspicious death by drowning. Even today, the medical community has no universally agreed diagnostic tests for drowning. Spilsbury himself had closely studied the pathology of drowning in the spectacular Brides in the Bath case of 1915, when George Joseph Smith, a swindler and bigamist, was accused of killing at least three of his wives. In each case, the victim had been found in the bath. Spilsbury exhumed the bodies and set about proving that they could not have died by natural causes— in court, it took him just twenty minutes to convince the jury that it is possible to murder someone and leave no marks of violence by suddenly submerging him or her in water while bathing. Smith was hanged. In the course of that case, Spilsbury had become intimately acquainted with the symptoms of drowning, the fine white froth known as champagne de mousse in the lungs and on the lips, the marbled and swollen appearance of the lungs, inflated by the inhalation of water, water in the stomach, foreign material such as vomit or sand in the lungs, and hemorrhages in the middle ear. A drowning person dies violently struggling, often bruising or rupturing the muscles in the neck or shoulder as he grasps and gasps for air. None of these symptoms would be present in the body of Glendower Michael, who had died not in water, but in a hospital bed. On the other side of the coin, anyone killed by phosphorus, however small the dose, would have yellowed skin and probably gastric burns, as well as significant traces of the chemical in the body, easily detectable with the science of 1943. The renowned forensic scientist did not examine the body of Glyndar Michael. Instead, Sir Bernard offered his opinion, as was his habit, d'hôte en bas, and stuck to it, come hell or high water. Spilsbury was also wrong in his complacent avowal that Spain contained no able pathologists, if the body was examined by a country doctor, the deception might pass unnoticed, but it was intended that the body and its documents should pass into German hands. There was at least one highly trained pathologist in Spain working for German intelligence, who would be able to spot the imposture as fast as Spilsbury himself, and probably faster. So far from offering certainty, Sir Bernard's opinion, accepted by Montague, represented an enormous gamble. If it failed then the victims of Spilsburyism could number in their thousands. Montague would later claim that the body used in the deception had died from pneumonia after exposure, that his relatives had been contacted and told that the body was needed for a really worthwhile purpose, and that permission was duly obtained on condition that I should never let it be known whose corpse it was. None of this was true. Montague and Chumley certainly made feverish inquiries into his past and about his relatives, but only to ensure that Glendower Michael had no past to speak of, and no relatives likely to cause problems by asking questions. Sarah was dead. Michael had two siblings, and two half-siblings, all still living in the Welsh valleys. Apparently they had not looked after him in life. There was little chance they would care more for him after death. Anyway, they were not consulted— Indeed, they were not even located. In a draft, unpublished manuscript, Montague wrote, The most careful possible inquiries, made even more carefully than usual in view of our proposals, failed to reveal any relative. 
Montague never did reveal Glendower Michael's identity. However, he could not remove his name from the official record, and he left personal papers that also identify him. In one letter, Montague referred to Glendower Michael as a ne'er-do-well, and his relatives were not much better. The actual person did nothing for anyone ever. Only his body did good after he was dead. It was true that Michael's life had been a short and unhappy one. He had never done well, but then he had never had much of an opportunity. Posthumously, the ne'er-do-well was about to do very well indeed. Bentley Purchase warned that time was of the essence. The corpse could not be frozen solid to arrest decay entirely, since fluids in the body expand as they turn to ice, damaging fragile soft tissue, which would be only too evident once the body was defrosted. The mortuary at St. Pancras had one extra-cold refrigerator, which could be set at 4 degrees centigrade, 39 degrees Fahrenheit, cold enough to retard decomposition substantially, but not so cold as to prevent it entirely. The body of Glendower Michael was already beginning to rot. If the corpse was to be of any use, warned Purchase, it would have to be used within three months. But before the operation could be formally launched, it needed a new code name. Trojan Horse had been acceptable as the initial title, but if any German agent were to stumble across it, the implication of some sort of hoax would be glaringly obvious. Code names were compiled by the Inter-Services Security Board, covering almost every aspect of the war. Nations, cities, plans, locations, military units, military operations, diplomatic meetings, places, individuals, and spies were all disguised under false names. In theory, these code words were neutral and indecipherable, a shorthand for those in the know and deliberately meaningless to anyone else. Random lists of code names were issued in alphabetical blocks of ten words and then selected by chance as needed. Six months after it became defunct, a code word could be reassigned and reused, a deliberate ploy to muddy the waters. Churchill had a clearly defined policy on choosing code words for major operations. They ought not to be given names of a frivolous character such as Bunny Hug and Bally Who, the Prime Minister decreed. Intelligent thought will already supply an unlimited number of well-sounding names that do not suggest the character of the operation and do not enable some widow or mother to say that her son was killed in an operation called Bunny Hug or Bally Who. The rule requiring that code words be devoid of meaning was routinely ignored by all sides throughout the war, for spies found the temptation to invent joking and hinting titles for their most secret projects almost irresistible. Agent Tate was so called because he looked like the music hall performer Harry Tate. The criminal Eddie Chapman was named Zigzag, since no one could be certain which way he might turn. Stalin, meaning Man of Steel, was awarded the code name Glyptic, meaning an image carved from stone. The Germans were even more culpable in this respect. The Nazis' long-range radar system was named Heimdall, after the Norse god with the power to see great distances. The planned invasion of Britain was codenamed Sea Lion, a most unsubtle reference to the lions on the royal coats of arms and the planned seaborne attack. Montague was scathingly critical of the obvious stupidity in selecting such revealing code words. The code name for Britain, he pointed out, was Golfplatz, meaning golf course, while America was Samland, a reference to Uncle Sam. Montague now broke his own rule that code names be chosen so that no deductions could be made from them, and selected a name that had been used for a mine-laying operation in 1941, and was now up for grabs again. Planned Trojan Horse became Operation Mincemeat. There was nothing haphazard about the choice. All the talk of corpses was having an effect, and Montague's sense of humour, having by this time become somewhat macabre, a code word that signified dead meat seemed only too apt and a good omen. There was no danger of any grieving mother complaining that her dead son had been deployed under a frivolous and tasteless code word, because, as the planners knew very well, in the case of Glyndar Michael, there was no one to grieve. Even before Bentley Purchase had completed his inquest, Chumley and Montague set to work, drawing up a formal proposal to put to the intelligence chiefs. On February 4th, a week after the death of Michael and on the very day Purchase completed his inquest, they presented a draft of Operation Mincemeat to the Twenty Committee. This operation is proposed in view of the fact that the enemy will almost certainly get information of the preparation of any assault mounted in North Africa and will try to find out its target.
The plan envisaged dropping the dead body with fake documents from a plane to give the impression that a courier carrying important hand-of-officer documents was en route for Algiers in an aircraft which crashed. The overall scheme should not only divert the Germans from the real target, but portray the real target as a cover target, a mere decoy. This was a brilliant piece of double bluff, for it would ensure that when the Germans found out about genuine preparations to attack Sicily, as they must, they would assume this was part of the deception plan. Sicily could not be left out of the equation altogether, for as Chumley and Montague pointed out, if the real target is omitted from both the operation plan and the cover plan, the Germans will almost certainly suspect, as not only is Sicily a very possible target, but the Germans are believed already to anticipate it as a possible target. Since the Germans will be looking with care for our cover plan as well as our real plan, Operation Mincemeat would feed them both a false real plan and a false cover plan, which would actually be the real plan. The outline did not go into specifics as to how this misinformation would be put across, nor where the body would be dropped, and warned that once launched, it could not be delayed. The body must be dropped within twenty-four hours of its being removed from its present place in London. The flight, once laid on, must not be cancelled or postponed. The Twenty Committee pondered only briefly, before issuing a flurry of requests to the representatives of the different services. The Air Ministry should investigate finding a suitable plane, preferably one used by SOE. The draft plan should be shown to the Intelligence Chiefs of the Army, Navy and RAF. Colonel Johnny Bevan of the London Controlling Section should be asked for his approval. The Admiralty should find out a suitable position for dropping the body, and the War Office should look into the question of providing the body with a name and necessary papers. The Naval Attaché in Madrid, Captain Alan Hilgarth, should be informed of the plan, so he will be able to cope with any unforeseen circumstances. Montague and Chumley were instructed to continue with preparations to give Mincemeat his necessary clothes, papers, letters, etc., etc. Out of the officially nameless corpse in the mortuary, they must conjure up a living person with a new name, a personality, and a past. Operation Mincemeat began as fiction, a plot twist in a long-forgotten novel, picked up by another novelist, and approved by a committee presided over by yet another novelist. Now it was the turn of the spies to take the reality of a dead Welsh tramp, make him into a fiction, and so change reality. Chapter 6 A Novel Approach Montague and Chumley had spent much of the previous three years nurturing, moulding, and deploying spies who did not exist. The Twenty Committee and Section B1A of MI5 had turned the playing of double agents into an art form, but as the double-cross system developed and expanded, more and more of the agents reporting back to Germany were purely fictional. Agent A, real, would notionally employ Agent B, unreal, who would in turn recruit other agents, C to Z, all equally imaginary. Juan Pujol Garcia, Agent Garbo, the most famous double agent of them all, was eventually equipped with no fewer than 27 sub-agents, each with a distinct character, friends, jobs, tastes, homes and lovers. Garbo's active and well-distributed team of imaginary assistants were a motley lot, including a Welsh Aryan supremacist, a communist, a Greek waiter, a wealthy Venezuelan student, a disaffected South African serviceman, and several crooks. In the words of John Masterman, the thriller-writing chairman of the Twenty Committee, the one-man band of Lisbon developed into an orchestra, and an orchestra which played a more and more ambitious program. Graham Green, a wartime intelligence officer in West Africa, based his novel Our Man in Havana, about a spy who invents an entire network of bogus informants on the Garbo story. Masterman, writing after the war, declared that, for deception, notional or imaginary agents were on the whole preferable to living ones. Real agents tended to become truculent and demanding. They needed feeding, pampering, and paying. An imaginary agent, however, was infinitely pliable and willing to do the bidding of his German handlers at once and without question. The Germans could seldom resist such a fly if it was accurately and skilfully cast, wrote Masterman, who was also handy with a fly-fishing rod. Maintaining a small army of fake people required concerted attention to detail. 
How difficult it was, wrote Montague, to remember the characteristics and life pattern of each one of a mass of completely non-existent notional sub-agents. These imaginary individuals had to suffer all the vagaries of normal life, such as getting ill, celebrating birthdays, and running out of money. They had to remain perfectly consistent in their behaviour, attitudes, and emotions. As Montague put it, the imaginary agent must never step out of character. The network of fake agents enabled British intelligence to supply the Germans with a steady stream of untruths and half-truths, and it lulled the Abwehr into believing it had a large and efficient espionage network in Britain, when it had nothing of the sort. Creating a personality to go with the corpse in the St. Pancras morgue would require imaginative effort on an even greater scale. In his novel The Case of the Four Friends, Masterman Sleuth, Ernest Brendel, observes that the key to detective work is anticipating the actions of the criminal, to work out the crime before it is committed, to foresee how it will be arranged, and then to prevent it. That's a triumph indeed. With Masterman's help, Montague and Chumley would now lay out the clues to a life that had never happened, and frame a new death for a dead man. The fictitious agents so far invented by the double-cross team all spoke for themselves, or rather through others, in wireless messages and letters to their handlers, but they were never seen. In the case of Operation Mincemeat, the fraudulent individual could communicate only through the clothes on his back, the contents of his pockets, and, most important, the letters in his possession. He would carry official typed letters to convey the core deception, but also handwritten personal letters to put across his personality. The more real he appeared, the more convincing the whole affair would be, reflected Montague, since every little detail would be studied by the Germans. The information he carried would have to be credible, but also legible. Would the ink of the manuscript letters and the signatures on the others not run so as to make the documents illegible, Montague wondered. Waterproof ink might be used, but that would give the game away. They turned to MI5 scientists, and numerous tests were carried out by using different inks and typewriters, and then immersing the letters in seawater for varying periods to test the effects. The results were encouraging. Many inks on a freshly written letter will run at once if the surface is wetted. On the other hand, a lot of quite usual inks, if thoroughly dried, will stand a fair amount of wetting even if exposed directly to the water. When a document is inside an envelope, or inside a wallet, which is itself inside a pocket, well-dried inks of some quite normal types will often remain legible for a surprising length of time, quite long enough for our purpose. The precise form of the deception would be decided in time. First, they needed to create a credible courier. It is no accident that Montague and Chumley were both enthusiastic novel readers. The greatest writers of spy fiction have, in almost every case, worked in intelligence before turning to writing. W. Somerset Maugham, John Buchan, Ian Fleming, Graham Greene, John le Carré, all had experienced the world of espionage firsthand. For the task of the spy is not so very different from that of the novelist, to create an imaginary, credible world, and then lure others into it by words and artifice. As if constructing a character in a novel, Montague and Chumley, with the help of Joan Saunders in Section 17M, set about creating a personality with which to clothe their dead body. Hour after hour, in the Admiralty basement, they discussed and refined this imaginary person, his likes and dislikes, his habits and hobbies, his talents and weaknesses. In the evening, they repaired to the Gargoyle Club, a glamorous Soho dive of which Montague was a member, to continue the odd process of creating a man from scratch. The project reflected all the possibilities and pitfalls of fiction. If they painted his personality too brightly, or were inconsistent in the portrait, then the Germans would surely detect a hoax. But if the enemy could be made to believe in this British officer, then they were that much more likely to credit the documents he carried. Eventually, they came to believe in him themselves. We talked about him until we did feel that he was an old friend, wrote Montague. He became completely real to us. They gave him a middle name, a nicotine habit, and a place of birth. They gave him a hometown, a rank, a regiment, and a love of fishing. He would be furnished with a watch, a bank manager, a solicitor, and cufflinks. They gave him all the things that Glendower Michael had lacked in his luckless life, including a supportive family, money, friends, and love. 
But first he needed a name, and, more important, a uniform. It was originally intended that the dropped body should appear to be that of an army officer, ferrying important messages to the top brass in North Africa. An army officer could wear battle dress, a normal combat uniform, rather than a formal fitted uniform. Army officers did not carry identity cards with photographs when travelling outside England, which obviated the need to obtain a mugshot of Glendower Michael for a fake card. The Director of Military Intelligence, however, pointed out that if the courier were an army officer, then the discovery of the body would have to be reported to the military attaché in Madrid, and the information passed from there to London, increasing the number of people in the know and the danger of a leak. Since the idea had originated in naval intelligence, it was more sensible to make him a naval officer, thus keeping the secret within naval circles. A naval officer, however, would be unlikely to carry documents relating to the planned invasion, and such officers always travelled in full naval display uniform, complete with braid and badges of rank on the sleeve. The idea of getting the corpse measured up by a tailor was too ghoulish, and too dangerous, to contemplate. The secret services contained men of varied talents and occupations, but no gentlemen's outfitters. After much discussion, it was decided that the body would be dressed as a member of the Royal Marines, the corps that forms the amphibious infantry of the Royal Navy. Marines always travelled in battle dress, made up of beret or cap, khaki blouse, trousers, gaiters and boots. This uniform came in standard sizes. Since the Marines, unlike the Army, travelled with photographic identity cards, one of these would have to be faked. This raised an additional problem. Although there were thousands of British Army officers currently serving, the number of Royal Marine officers was comparatively small, and their names appeared on the Navy list, of which German intelligence undoubtedly possessed a copy. One of these would need to lend his name to the dead body. Casting his eye down the list of serving naval officers, Montague noticed a large block of men with the surname Martin. No fewer than nine of these were Royal Marines, eight lieutenants and one captain, who had been promoted to acting major in 1941. The ferrying of important documents would be entrusted to a fairly senior officer, so Captain William Hind Norrie Martin was unknowingly press-ganged into the job. The real Norrie Martin had joined up in 1937, becoming one of the fleet air arm's best pilots. In 1943, he was instructing American air crew at Quonset Point, Rhode Island, and thus unlikely to get wind of what was being done with his name. By pure coincidence, the real Martin had served aboard the aircraft carrier Hermes, which had been sunk by the Japanese in April 1942, with the loss of more than 300 men. A death notice for the fake William Martin would need to be posted in the British press. The Germans would believe this referred to the body carrying the documents, but the real Major Martin's friends and colleagues would probably assume he had died in the sinking of the Hermes, with his death only belatedly confirmed. Major William Bill Martin was duly issued identity card number 148228 by the Admiralty. He was made four years younger than Glendower Michael, but Cardiff was chosen as his place of birth, just ten miles from Michael's birthplace in Abobagoid. The card assigned Martin to combined operations, the force set up to harass the Germans by combined navy and army operations, and directed by Lord Louis Mountbatten. The identity card was suspiciously shiny, so as an added precaution it was endorsed, issued in lieu of number 09650, lost. This was Montague's own identity card number, to ensure that anyone investigating this non-existent officer with the fake identity card would eventually come to him. Losing an identity card was a serious lapse in wartime Britain, but as well as explaining its newness, the replacement card provided the first plank in the personality of Bill Martin. He was accident-prone. Montague signed the card, the first of many occasions when he would stand in for Bill Martin. All that was needed to complete the card was a photograph. Glendower Michael had never had a passport or any other form of photographic identity card, and trying to obtain a recent photograph, if such a thing existed, would have involved contacting the Michael family. Montague and Chumley repaired to the St. Pancras mortuary with a camera and a tape measure. While Chumley measured Glendower for the Royal Marine battle dress and boots, Montague prepared him for his photograph. It was the first time they had seen the body. The face seemed thin and sickly, 
rather different from the strapping young warrior they had already framed in their minds. Still, as Montague remarked, he does not have to look like an officer, only like a staff officer, and these were seldom the most impressive physical specimens. This was possibly the first time Glendower Michael had ever been photographed. The morbid modelling session was a complete failure. After only a few days, the eyes of a corpse in cold storage begin to sink into the skull, and the facial muscles start to sag. It is simply impossible to take a photograph of the face of a dead person that looks anything other than entirely, unmistakably dead. Michael had been emaciated before he died. Every day he spent in the St. Pancras mortuary, he looked slightly deader. No matter at what angle he was photographed, and under what light, the newly named William Martin resolutely refused to come alive for the camera. Back in the office, and in the street, Montague and Chumley surreptitiously scanned the faces of friends and strangers alike, in the hope of spotting someone who might stand in as Bill Martin's double. Glendower Michael's face was unremarkable, with greying hair, thinning in front. It was not, thought Montague, an appearance that would have singled him out in a crowd. Yet finding someone who even vaguely resembled him was proving extraordinarily difficult. While Montague searched for the right face, rudely staring at anyone with whom we came into contact, Chumley went clothes shopping. Glendower Michael had been tall and thin, almost the same build as Chumley himself. Chumley first bought braces, gaiters, and standard-issue military boots, size 12. Then, having obtained permission from Colonel Neville of the Royal Marines, he presented himself at Geeves, the military tailors in Piccadilly, to be fitted for a Royal Marines battle dress, complete with appropriate badges of rank, Royal Marine flashes, and the badge flashes of combined operations. The uniform was finished off with a trench coat and beret. The clothes would need the patina of wear, since, if they were too stiff and new, the Germans might suspect a plant. So Chumley climbed into the uniform and wore it every day for the next three months. Underwear was a more ticklish problem. Chumley, understandably, was unwilling to surrender his own, since good underwear was hard to come by in rationed wartime Britain. They consulted John Masterman, Oxford academic and chairman of the Twenty Committee, who came up with a scholarly solution that was also personally satisfying. The difficulty of obtaining underclothes, owing to the system of coupon rationing, wrote Masterman, was overcome by the acceptance of a gift of thick underwear from the wardrobe of the late warden of New College, Oxford. Major Martin would be kitted out with the flannel vest and underpants of none other than H. A. L. Fisher, the distinguished Oxford historian and former president of the Board of Education in Lloyd George's cabinet. John Masterman and Herbert Fisher had both taught history at Oxford in the 1920s, and had long enjoyed a fierce academic rivalry. Fisher was a figure of ponderous grandeur and gravity who ran New College, according to one colleague, as one enormous mausoleum. Masterman considered him long-winded and pompous. Fisher had been run over and killed by a truck while attending a tribunal examining the appeals of conscientious objectors, of which he was chairman. The obituaries paid resounding tribute to his intellectual and academic stature, which nettled Masterman. Putting the great man's underclothes on a dead body and floating it into German hands was just the sort of joke that appealed to his odd sense of humour. Masterman described the underwear as a gift. It seems far more likely that he simply arranged for the dead Don's drawers to be pressed into war service. Montague and Chumley were both, in different ways, adapting themselves to the part of Bill Martin. Montague had forged his signature. Chumley was wearing his clothes. Slowly, the personality of Major Martin was coming into focus, a character that would have to be revealed by whatever was in his wallet, pockets, and briefcase. Martin, it was decided, was the adored son of an upper-middle-class family from Wales. His Welshness was virtually the only concession to the real identity of the body. He was a Roman Catholic. Catholic countries were known to be more reluctant to carry out surgical autopsies, and this reluctance would presumably be compounded if the body was thought to be that of a co-religionist. The William Martin they conjured up was clever, even brilliant, industrious but forgetful, and inclined to the grand gesture. He liked a good time, enjoyed the theatre and dancing, and spent more than he had, relying on his father to bail him out. His mother, Antonia, had died some years earlier. They began to ink in his past. 
He had been educated, they decided, at private school and university. He was a secret writer of considerable promise, though he had never published anything. After university, he had retired to the country to write, listen to music, and fish. He was something of a loner. With the outbreak of war, he had signed up with the Royal Marines, but found himself consigned to an office which he disliked. Keen for more active and dangerous work, he had escaped by switching to the commandos, and had distinguished himself by his aptitude for technical matters, notably the mechanics of landing craft. He had predicted that the Dieppe raid would be a disaster, and he had been right. Martin was, they concluded, a thoroughly good chap, romantic and dashing, but also somewhat feckless, unpunctual and extravagant. The first witness to Martin's fictional character was his bank manager. Montague approached Ernest Whitley Jones, joint general manager of Lloyd's Bank, and asked him if he would be prepared to write an angry letter about an overdraft that did not exist to a client who was also imaginary, a request that is unique in the annals of British banking. Whitley Jones was, perhaps predictably, a cautious man. It was not, he pointed out, normal practice for the general manager of the bank's head office to perform such a mundane task, but when Montague explained that he would rather not bring in anyone else, the manager relented. Such a letter could sometimes come from head office, he said, especially when the general manager was the personal friend of the father of a young customer, whose extravagance needs some check, and the father does not want to nag his son. Private. Major W. Martin. Royal Marines. 14th April, 1943. Army and Navy Club, Pall Mall, London, S.W. 1. Dear Sir, I am given to understand that in spite of repeated application, your overdraft amounting to £79, 19 shillings and tuppence, still outstands. In the circumstances, I am now writing to inform you that unless this amount, plus interest at 4% to date of payment, is received forthwith, we shall have no alternative but to take the necessary steps to protect our interests. Yours faithfully, E. E. Whitley Jones, Joint General Manager. The Dunning letter was addressed to Major Martin at the Army and Naval Club in Pall Mall. This, it was decided, would be Martin's home when in town. Chumley obtained a bill from the club, made out to Major Martin. Having imagined Martin's father, Montague and Chumley now decided this anxious parent deserved a larger part in the unfolding drama. Enter John C. Martin, pater familius, a father of the old school, in Montague's words, who may well have been modelled on his own father, affectionate but formal and controlling. The letter itself was probably written by Cyril Mills, a colleague in MI5. Mills, the son of the circus impresario Bertram Mills, had taken over the circus business after his father's death in 1938, and was now one of the key operatives in the Double Cross team. Mills knew how to put on an impressive show. The resulting letter, pompous and pedantic, as only an Edwardian father could be, was a brilliant tour de force. Telephone number 98, Black Lion Hotel, Mould, North Wales. 13th April, 1943. My dear William, I cannot say that this hotel is any longer as comfortable as I remember it to have been in pre-war days. I am, however, staying here as the only alternative to imposing myself once more upon your aunt, whose depleted staff and strict regard for fuel economy, which I agree to be necessary in wartime, has made the house almost uninhabitable to a guest, at least one of my age. I propose to be in town for the nights of 20th and 21st of April, when no doubt we shall have an opportunity to meet. I enclose the copy of a letter which I have written to Gwatkin of McKenna's about your affairs. You will see that I have asked him to lunch with me at the Carlton Grill, which I understand still to be open, at a quarter to one on Wednesday the 21st. I should be glad if you would make it possible to join us. We shall not, however, wait luncheon for you, so I trust that if you are able to come, you will make a point of being punctual. Your cousin Priscilla has asked to be remembered to you. She has grown into a sensible girl, though I cannot say that her work for the land army has done much to improve her looks. In that respect, I am afraid that she will take after her father's side of the family. Your affectionate father. Chumley and Montague were now enjoying themselves, warming to the task of invention, the depth of detail, the odd plot twists, the exasperated father sorting out his son's financial affairs, resentful of his sister-in-law's rule over the family house, 
and of having to stay in a second-class hotel. Niece Priscilla, sensible but chunky, with, it was implied, a slight crush on her older cousin Bill. The hints of wartime deprivation and rationing. The artful ink splotch on the first page. Montague's acidulous sense of humour ran through every word of the forgeries. While the larger themes of Martin's life were being sketched out, Chumley also began to gather the smaller items that a wartime officer might carry in his pockets and wallet, individually unimportant, but vital corroborative detail. In modern spy parlance, this is known as wallet litter, the little things everyone accumulates that describe who we are and where we have been. Martin's pocket litter would include a book of stamps, two used, a silver cross on a neck chain, and a St. Christopher's medallion, to emphasise his Catholic piety, a pencil stub, keys, a pack of players' navy-cut cigarettes, the traditional navy smoke, matches, and a used tuppenny bus ticket. In his wallet they inserted a pass for Combined Operations Headquarters, which had expired, as further evidence of his lackadaisical attitude to security. The members of Section 17M, all of whom were party to the secret, added their own refinements. There was much discussion over exactly which wartime nightclub Bill might favour. Marjorie Boxall, Montague's secretary, obtained an invitation to the Cabaret Club, a swinging London night spot, as proof of Martin's taste for the high life. To this was added a small fragment of a torn letter, written to Bill from an address in Perthshire, relaying some snippet of romantic gossip. At the last moment, which was the more to be regretted, since he had scarcely ever seen her before, still, as I told him at the time, the handwriting is that of John Masterman. Two identity discs, stamped Major W. Martin, R.M., R.C., Roman Catholic, were attached to the braces that would hold the dead man's trousers up. A bill for shirts from Geeves, paid in cash, was crumpled up in preparation for stuffing into a pocket. Bill Martin would be carrying cash on his final journey, one five-pound note, three one-pound notes, and some loose change. The banknote numbers were carefully noted. As with all money that might be passed to or received from the enemy, the currency was carefully tracked, in case it might reappear somewhere significant. If the money disappeared after the body arrived in Spain, it would at least prove that the clothes had been searched. Nothing was left to chance. Everything the body wore or carried was minutely inspected to ensure that it added to the story, on the assumption that the Germans would make every effort to find a flaw in Major Martin's make-up, and yet something was missing from Martin's life. It was Joan Saunders who pointed it out. He had no love life. Bill Martin must be made to fall in love. We decided that a marriage would be arranged between Bill Martin and some girl just before he was sent abroad, wrote Montague, though he might refer nonchalantly to some girl. Montague already had a girl firmly in mind.